one of the most difficult times in your career will be that transition from when you've been a researcher full-time, a PhD student, maybe a postdoctoral researcher, to when you become an academic. It's a very, very challenging time, but hopefully in this video I can deal with some of the issues that you might face at that particular time, and hopefully some of this will be quite useful to you. So the first thing I'll talk about is lack of focus on research, and that sometimes happens to people when they start becoming an academic. So you've been a researcher, you know how to do it, you've been doing that, you got the job because you're a great researcher, but suddenly your job has exploded in terms of the diversity of new things that you have to do. You've got teaching, you've got administration, you've got public communication of your research, public communication of your teaching researching into new things and so on. So it just happens that you've got so many new things on your agenda that perhaps, and this happens to some people, the research part gets a little bit quiet and you lose some focus on that research. And I need to say to you that that really cannot happen. No matter what else, you must maintain some amount of your working week to focus on that research and to develop it, irrespective of all of the other new tasks that you have. Lack of focus on research can sometimes come back to bite you in the butt maybe some years later where you look back and you think, well, that was a little bit of a quiet time. You can't let it be a quiet time. You must maintain that focus on research and just make sure that you manage all of your other parts of your job so that you can maintain your researcher credentials. A huge mistake that people make is that they don't seek mentorship early on. Now, just to let you know, I have three mentors at any given time. I have one who mentors me intensively about my research. I've got a mentor who's a career guidance type of person, and I actually pay them money in order to get a meeting maybe two, three, four times a year with them so that we can discuss where things are, where they're going, what maybe I should focus on and what, what I should do. And I used to be the head of a school, and so I sought out the mentorship of a former head of school in the same institution. And we used to just meet for coffee to discuss issues, and they could answer my questions and help me along. Not seeking mentorship it really is one of those big mistakes that you can make, and you need to get that straight away when you get into your new institution. Just think, who will I go to? Who would agree to this? And quite often there are formal mentorship programs, but even an informal mentorship is a really good idea. One of the things that you need to watch out for is overcommitment. Overcommitment to teaching, overcommitment to administration, overcommitment to research, overcommitment to outreach. You need to just make those commitments that really fit into your working week and that will work for you. Because what happens is, when you overcommit, you start to miss deadlines. You start to not do those parts of the job particularly well. And it's very, very easy because we all get invited onto this committee and that committee and to do this and to go here and so on. All the time, we do. But you must make those commitments that mean that you're activity is going to be of high quality and that you can manage what's going on. So you come into the job, you've just come from a really great research institution or wherever you've been, you've got lots of friends there, lots of colleagues, and you can make the big mistake of just relying on those colleagues to be your network to help you out in the years ahead. You've got to expand that network. No matter how difficult, how awkward, how uncomfortable that feels, how much it takes you outside of your zone, you must expand your network so that you're getting new ideas, so that you're meeting new people. Maintaining the old friendships, that's a great idea. It really is. It's fantastic. Certainly, I'm not saying don't do that, but really, you've got to network. You've got to find out new ideas outside of where you're comfortable, and you've got to really sort of expand your horizons early on as an early career researcher. It's a really great idea to run a kind of mixed economy. That is to say that you are doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other in your research area to see what suits you best in your new environment. What's going to be really, really great for you? What can you own? And one of the ways in which you can do that is perhaps to take your existing network, fine, but expand that. Expand that so that you can explore new horizons and you can do new things. And it's a big mistake for people to not do that early on in their career because it can be so much uh, a launch pad for this new phase of your career. Now, I'm a big advocate of having a research agenda that, at least initially, is really quite broad. You're exploring new avenues of research and figuring out what you need to do. But 
at some point you've got to settle down and develop a really really clear research agenda for you you need to answer the following question so ask yourself this question right now what am I going to know in five years time that I don't know now that's your research agenda what will I do what am I going to know it's not really a fantastic idea to just do stuff, to just be busy, to just doing things that you're familiar with and that you're comfortable with. What's the new thing? What's the thing that's going to be personal to you? You must develop your own research agenda. And I'm going to make videos about how to make your own research agenda, how to set out a research strategy. And I think it's something that's very, very important, particularly at the early career researcher stage, that you have the clearest of clear research agendas for you. So this all sounds like I'm advocating that you do more and you do more and you do, do more. I really do not advocate that at all. I advocate doing an appropriate amount of work. I don't work weekends personally. I try not to work evenings. You know, I'll answer a few emails, but not much. I, poor time management is a problem and it's a skill to have good time management. I'll give you an example. An email comes in to me. I act on it. It doesn't matter. If I see it, that's the trigger. I have to act on it. It either gets deleted because it's of no use to me, or it gets filed into a particular place and flagged for future work, or I answer it immediately. That is it. There is no compromise on that. Why? Because if you let that email stay in your inbox, it goes down and down and down and down, and then you forget about it. And in three weeks' time, somebody comes along and says, you know, that deadline is tomorrow. So you need to take classes if you're not particularly good in time management because it can absolutely open doors for you that you can manage your time deal with issues you become so incredibly reliable for your colleagues as well it's such a great idea there are Udemy courses on it Skillshare courses on it I'm going to talk about it but thinking about time management means that you will achieve hopefully a really good work-life balance, you become reliable and it will be much less stressful for you to do your job and to do it really, really well. If you work in a field where grants are important, then you must be excellent at writing those grants. And I think it's one of those skills that we don't really learn as we go through being a PhD student and a postdoc, not really so much. And it results in people not really knowing how to write grants when they become an early career academic. And I've got a really great example of somebody that wasn't fantastic, me. I was terrible. Do you know how many of the first eight grants that I wrote, do you know how many I got? None. Not even one. I'm eternally grateful to a colleague who I met in the corridor and said, why are you not getting grants? And I said, I don't know. She said, show me your grant proposals. I showed them to her. She said, these are terrible. I didn't realize they were terrible. I didn't know why. She told me about setting up my research agenda, getting the problem right up at the very top. The problem was appearing about page four of my research proposals. You get it right up at the top. I learned the skills. I borrowed good grants from people. I got better and I got better. And do you know how many of the next four grant proposals that I was awarded? Four. All four. And the difference was that I finally understood how to write a grant, how to structure it. Sure, I was lucky with the next four, but it gave me confidence. What I would say to you is take grant writing classes. Understand how to write grants. It will make your world so much better. It will help you to get that funding that you need and take you on to the next stage of your career. But writing grants doesn't come natural to anybody. You've, it's a skill. It's learned. And I would advise you take classes on this throughout your whole career and give people your grant to, to see and make sure that you can see other grant proposals that have been successful so that you can learn from the, those and you'll always learn. Finally, I'm going to talk about publications and getting your stuff out there. It's quite often the case as an early career academic that you possibly your lab, if you've got a lab, your research group, they're not up and running and it takes a few years to get that going. Well, at that particular point, you probably still need to publish. And it's a very, very good idea as part of your networking and so on to become maybe involved with other people's publications. Maybe you're not the lead author for a while. That's okay. That's fine. But it gives you an opportunity if, the, if you don't have huge amounts of research 
resources at the beginning. It's a great opportunity to go and talk to other people, to become part of their group as well, to understand new things and to keep your publication record going and going and going. Uh, there's also the idea that at that particular point, you're quite often really an expert because you've been a researcher for so long, really an expert in an area. So there's no harm in writing perspective articles, review articles, opinion articles on things, even if you don't have new data yourself. But keeping that publication record going, keeping it ticking over, that's really, really great. The community starts to appreciate that you're in your new position. They start to understand where you are and it keeps a little bit of confidence in you to keep going. At every stage of your career, you can improve your communication skills. I mean, I'm talking to a camera here. I didn't ever really do this 20 years ago. It wasn't a thing that you made videos and put them on the internet, either your lectures or a research seminar or something like this. It didn't happen. So the world keeps changing and communication keeps changing and you've got to keep changing to keep up with it. I don't really know what TikTok is, but I know that science communication does happen on TikTok and research communication happens on YouTube and Facebook and all of these social media platforms on Instagram and so on. And it's really, really great to see this happening. But communication has become such an important part of being a researcher now that as an early career academic, you've got to just make sure that you are up to date with your communication. And if you don't feel terribly comfortable communicating your research, there are skills that you can borrow. There are things that you can do that maybe give you more confidence, at least give you a structure on how to structure a, to a talk, how to structure a lecture, how to structure a seminar, and so on. And even if it doesn't feel like it comes terribly naturally to you, following some simple rules can really, really help. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you've got any comments, please leave them below. Thank you.